Hi friends, my name is Tris, and this is No Boilerplate, focusing on fast, technical videos. This is my follow-up video on Rust and WebAssembly. Do check out part one if you haven't already. A quiet revolution happened in 2017, the revolution of WebAssembly, but it has been slow to be adopted by popular programming languages. As I outlined in the first video, Rust adopted WebAssembly instantly, and thanks to good language design, good community attitudes, and some good luck, Rust is the best language to write WebAssembly apps in today. Let's take a step back. Web programming used to be a frustrating place. I was there not so long ago. But even in the early days of HTML embeds and bad JavaScript, it was obvious that the world had changed overnight. It's easy to see in hindsight, but at the time, on the ground, the technologies we used were so bad. JavaScript no longer is a bad programming language. It's aggressively fine. But at the time, it was terrible. The web was full of frames and errors and plugins. The interface, which for most sites was black on white with blue links, looked terrible too, and was different on every computer. Best viewed on IE5, sites would tell you. Remember that? The web wasn't a hit because it looked pretty, nor was it easy to build apps for or fast or efficient on the client or server. What made it so good, and still does, despite all these years past, is the ease of distribution. Anyone with access to a computer can handwrite a text file, host it somewhere, often for free, and then boom! Your words are accessible worldwide. That's nothing short of incredible. And for application developers, there's no installation on your customer's computer. It's the thin client dream of the 70s. There's no patching and no difficulty in supporting old versions of your app, which still plagues mobile app developers to this day. We put up with the annoyances of the web, happily, to get this incredible distribution advantage. No mailing customers disks or CDs, or even giving Google or Apple a large portion of your app store revenue. Just direct access between apps and users. The web heralded the end of many of the old gatekeepers, but it's not perfect. I am a web developer and have been for 15 years, and I love the UI model inside the browser, which is called the DOM, the Document Object Model. It's flexible, dynamic, and can do nearly anything. Nearly anything. What if you want to write your own UI, unconstrained by the browser's idea of how you should build it? For that, you need WebGL. Here is an example of an app, Wavacity built with a native UI framework and ported to WebAssembly. The framework here is WX Widgets, but many others have been ported, including giants such as GTK and Qt. Let's get some simple facts out of the way. WebAssembly is much faster than JavaScript for pure computation. Current browser implementations bottleneck at DOM manipulations, but that's not a problem if you use WebGL with GPU access via OpenGL. And when we stop thinking about web apps as web pages and start thinking of them as real apps operating on real data, it's natural to store the data right where the user is for low latency processing. You can sync too, if the user wants that. Every week we hear about new, faster JavaScript frameworks coming out, offering more and more DOM manipulations per second. Svelte compared to React, for instance. They're useful for a DOM-constrained app, but we have access to native UI speeds, no latency, and 60 FPS with WebGL. A great example of how to do this right is returning sponsor, Quadratic. Quadratic are building an open source spreadsheet for engineers and data scientists built in Rust, WebAssembly, and WebGL. This might be the coolest spreadsheet I've ever used, and I've used Emacs. You can choose your formula language, either simple Excel style statements or SQL and Python, both standards in the field of data science. Because all data is evaluated in WebAssembly, Quadratic is fast. The UI is in WebGL with hardware acceleration in all modern browsers, allowing 60 FPS scrolling, complex graphics, and smooth pinch to zoom. This is a really exciting project that I am delighted to say is hiring. Quadratic are looking for Rust developers for their rewrite, the existing code is in TypeScript, people with WebGL experience, even if that's only with JavaScript, people with Apache Arrow experience for processing Quadratic's high performance datasets, and senior engineers used to working at the pace of a startup. Check out and start the project on GitHub at github.com forward slash quadratic HQ and view their open jobs at careers.quadratic.2. My thanks to Quadratic for their support of this channel. Let's look at another example of a large scale WebGL app that hasn't paid me to talk about them. Figma is a collaborative interface design app powered by WebGL and WebAssembly. Though much of the UI is HTML, the core product, the interface designer, runs on the GPU in WebAssembly. The complexity of multiple nested UI projects would not be possible to emulate in the DOM, especially for the pixel-perfect mockups that the app is designed to build. Enough examples. What can we write in Rust today? Let's start simple with some WebGL rendered text by the project Bracket. 
Bracket provides a virtual ASCII terminal and a game loop. This frees you up from implementation difficulties, making it easy to write grid-based games and apps. It also provides assistance with keyboard and mouse inputs. Let's see what this example looks like. Marvelous, now we're coding like it's 1989. But Bracket is doing a deceptively large amount of work for you here, in a deployed size of just 500 kilobytes. It's WebGL native, 60 FPS, WebAssembly deployment ready to go. And if you've ever tried to build a terminal-based interface or game, you will know how obnoxious the terminal can be, with poorly documented control codes and terminal emulators having their own quirks. Not so with Bracket. It looks like a terminal, but it isn't. Next, let's build a modern interface. EGUI is one of the biggest native UI toolkits built from the ground up for Rust. Yes, you could use GTK and others, but they link to the C libraries, and you'll have an interesting time using the WebGL ports. As usual, I recommend keeping things pure Rust. To build a whole EGUI app, use eFrame, the EGUI framework. We start, as ever, with defining the valid states of our system, then implement the default trade for our app struct. The default trade, which defines a single method, also called default, returns an instance of our struct with prefilled data. You will find this default method in many places in the standard library and third-party crates, where it makes sense to create a default configuration of a structure. It's like the new method pattern in that regard. Here's the UI we are going to build, by the way. We've got a heading, a label and text box, a slider, a button, and another label. Here's the code. We implement EGUI's app trait and define a single update method. You can see the heading, label and text box, slider, button, and other label here. Persistence is through updating self, which is passed in as the first parameter of the update method. Any data you can fit in a struct could be persisted in this way, which is to say, anything you like. Here are some of the widgets available to you in eGUI, out of the box. And on their website, which of course is written in WebGL and WebAssembly, they demo code editors, a curl client, and lots of other widgets. eGUI is an immediate mode framework. This makes it simple to reason with and simple to integrate with game or other OpenGL frameworks that expect to re-render every frame. Game frameworks like Bevy, which is a featureful 2D or 3D game engine built from the ground up in Rust. There are many examples of 2D and 3D rendering on their website, all running smoothly in WebGL. Here is a simple scene in Bevy. This shows how to render simple primitive shapes with a single color. In this case, a blue rectangle. Here's how it looks on my machine. Nothing groundbreaking, but it's hardware accelerated and WebGL ready. Bevy features real-time 2D graphics for games and apps, a modern and flexible 3D renderer, lights, shadows, cameras, meshes, textures, and materials. You can load audio files and play them on demand. Asset changes are immediately reflected in running Bevy apps. You can hot reload scenes, textures, and meshes. And all of this can be recompiled in one to three seconds for instant feedback. And Bevy doesn't just support WebGL. Looking forward, a new standard based on Vulkan, Metal, and Direct3D is being developed at the moment called WebGPU. It remains to be seen if it will replace WebGL. If it does, and you're writing a low-level WebGL app, then yes, rewriting will be needed. However, that's not how we build our apps and games. If you use a UI library, like the ones I demoed today, then you are insulated somewhat against migration pain. You simply wait for the UI library to be ported over to the new underlying system. Bevy already supports WebGPU. Until then, WebGL is ready in all browsers now. To paraphrase the late and great Aaron Schwartz, think about the ideal way to write a web app write the code to make it happen. Any app, game, or experience you can dream of is yours to make with Rust and WebGL. What will you build? If you'd like to see what you can write in Rust, click the top video. I used it to make a fun retro computer visualization for my Hope Punk podcast, Lost Terminal. Or if urban fantasy is more your bag, click the bottom video to listen to a strange and beautiful podcast I produce called Modem Prometheus. If you would like to support my work, head to patreon.com forward slash no boilerplate. Transcripts and compile checked markdown source code are available on GitHub, links in the description, and corrections are in the pinned errata comment. Thank you so much for watching. Talk to you on Discord.